Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are wrapping up our discussion of pulmonary physiology, and this is recording part seven. The next very common pulmonary disease that we're going to discuss is obstructive sleep apnea. In this condition, patients have episode of apnea lasting 10 seconds or longer, or hypopnea, which is just shallow breathing, occurring during sleep. This is diagnosed in a sleep lab where the patient's uh, breathing is monitored, and they calculate what's called an apnea hypopnea index, an AHI, which is the number of episodes per hour of sleep. In adults, mild disease, moderate, and severe disease, each are correlated to a certain number of a certain AHI. Patients with OSA usually have snoring and labored breathing during sleep, eventually leading to apnea, which wakes them up, and this causes sleep fragmentation, which is terrible for you. First of all, they're tired, so they have daytime drowsiness, they have poor memories, they may get into motor vehicle accidents, uh, fall asleep on the job, and it also causes increased sympathetic activity, hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, and right ventricular failure. Most patients who have sleep apnea have some sort of soft tissue obstruction in the pharynx, kind of like what we see when patients obstruct after we put them to sleep in anesthesia. The muscle, the tissues in your pharyngeal airway decrease their tone during sleep. Um, those dilator muscles relax and they get obstruction. This is obviously more common in obese patients, patients who have large tongues or tonsils, but it can happen in anybody. Um, and we're still doing research on all the different factors that can predispose patients to sleep apnea. These patients continue to try breathing, and if you look at them, you'll see their chest going up and down, but there's no air movement because they're obstructed. We can do a very quick screening on our patients to see what their likelihood is of having sleep apnea. And this is called the STOP-BANG score. The mnemonic STOP-BANG stands for snoring loudly, tired during the daytime, observed apnea, pressure for high blood pressure, BMI greater than 35, age greater than 50, neck size greater than 17 inches, or 16 inches in females, and gender equal to male. A stop bang score of 3 to 4 puts you at medium risk of sleep apnea, whereas 5 to 8 is high risk. What are the treatments for sleep apnea? Well, in extreme cases, they can do surgical procedures to try and remove some of the redundant soft tissue that collapses. More commonly, we see patients using a CPAP or a BiPAP device to keep their airways open during sleep. CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. So they're basically, every time they try to breathe out, there's a machine trying to blow air back in in order to pop open those airways. And BiPAP does the same thing, except it has two levels of pressure, one level during expiration and a higher level during inspiration. And this is kind of like the pressure support mode that we would use in our anesthesia machines. There are a lot of anesthesia considerations with sleep apnea. I just want to focus for now on the post-operative anesthesia concerns. In these patients, we really need to do everything we can to minimize opioids because they are at exquisite risk for respiratory depression when they get opioids we should encourage them to use CPAP or BiPAP, especially if they use it at home. These patients should probably be kept in a monitored setting after anesthesia until it's really out of the system, especially if they're going to be getting any post-operative opioids. And that includes going home with Percocet or Vicodin or something like that. If you are going to send a patient like this home and you want to give them opioids, we really need to make sure that they don't die in bed in the middle of the night from uh, respiratory depression combined with their obstructive disease. A lot of places have guidelines about how long these patients need to be in PACU. Some places say four or five hours even. What I like to see is for this patient to have a good oxygen saturation. I wanna see that they're breathing and ventilating without obstructing or having apnea. And I need to see that they're sleeping. It's no good if they're sitting awake and watching TV. They need to be sleeping just like they're going to be doing at 3 in the morning when they're at risk of, of getting a bad airway obstruction and dying.
I need to see this patient sleeping with medications on board, good oxygen saturation, and no obstruction for several hours. And that's what makes me comfortable that they can go home safely. Otherwise, they should probably be kept in the hospital where they can be monitored. There is another kind of sleep apnea called central sleep apnea. And this is when your central nervous system's respiratory drive is impaired. This isn't about soft tissue obstruction. This is about your brain not triggering breaths. Now, some obese patients can develop what's called obesity hypoventilation syndrome, where their brain stem, their respiratory center, stops making respiratory efforts because it's become desensitized to hypercarbia. And there are other causes of central sleep apnea, which we don't really need to go into in this course. Now let's talk about restrictive lung disease or interstitial lung disease. We touched on this before when we looked at flow volume loops and spirometry. A couple examples of restrictive lung disease would be things that affect the lung itself, like pulmonary fibrosis, and things that affect the ability of the chest wall to expand, like scoliosis or kyphosis. Let's talk about one example of restrictive lung disease, which is called sarcoidosis. This is a granulomatous disorder where you get these granuloma formations in the lung tissues um, and other tissues too, but it especially affects the lungs. Patients who have sarcoidosis have pulmonary symptoms like dyspnea, cough, and abnormal chest x-ray. And on their spirometry, you'll see a restrictive pattern, which means their FVC will be decreased, their gas diffusion may be impaired, but their peak flows and their FEV1 to FVC ratio should be relatively normal. Other symptoms that you may see in patients with sarcoidosis include cardiac conduction defects, facial nerve palsies, and often these patients are treated with corticosteroids. When doing anesthesia for patients with sarcoidosis, we should consider that they have a low FRC and therefore a low oxygen reserve, and therefore they may desaturate quickly after induction of anesthesia. We should also maintain low peak airway pressures because they have a restrictive lung disease and low lung volumes. Next, we're going to talk about pulmonary edema. We know that edema is whenever fluid leaks out of the vascul vasculature into some interstitial space. In pulmonary edema, the intervascular fluid is leaking into the interstitium of the lungs. This can happen for two primary reasons. You could have increased capillary pressure, and that pushes fluid from the capillaries into the lung parenchyma, into the interstitium. And you can have increased capillary pressure for cardiogenic reasons. You can have high hydrostatic pressures. You can have neurogenic pulmonary edema due to a brain injury. Or altitude sickness can also lead to the development of pulmonary edema. Another cause of pulmonary edema is damage to the capillaries, and the capillaries become leaky. They have increased permeability. This happens in the acute respiratory distress syndrome, or if patients aspirate gastric contents and get an acid injury, a pneumonitis inside their lungs. One specific type of pulmonary edema that I would like to discuss is negative pressure pulmonary edema. This occurs when a patient vigorously tries to breathe in, but there's an airway obstruction. The obstruction could be laryngospasm, which is one of the most common post-anesthesia causes of NPPE, or a tumor, or any even just upper airway obstruction, like in an obese patient or someone who has sleep apnea, or if the endotracheal tube becomes kinked, or if the patient bites on it, and it can happen with an LMA as well as a tube. When these patients do this, they're breathing in very hard, and it especially happens in younger, stronger patients. They take a big deep breath against a closed airway, and it generates very high negative intrapleural pressures. Remember, we said that a normal breath in only needs an intrapleural pressure of about minus one. These patients can generate negative pressures of minus 50 to even minus 100. When this happens, it creates like a vacuum in the lungs, and the interstitial hydrostatic pressure goes way down, venous return goes up, they become hypertensive from the sympathetic response, 
and all of this leads to fluid pouring into the lungs and it causes pulmonary edema. And you may see large volumes of pink frothy fluid coming from the lungs. This is a very severe injury, potentially, and we need to support these patients until the lungs can heal. They need supportive care. Many people recommend some diuresis, and occasionally they need to be put back on the ventilator, intubated and maintained, at least for overnight. In the most severe cases, patients have even needed to go on ECMO until their lungs can recover from the injury. If we do reintubate these patients, we should use a lung protective strategy for ventilation, which means low tidal volumes of 5 to 7 mils per kilogram, an increased respiratory rate in order to maintain adequate minute ventilation, permissive hypercapnia, so we allow them to become a little hypercapnic, and PEEP is very important to avoid atelectasis, especially at these low tidal volumes. Pneumonia is an infection in the lungs, a bacterial infection or even a viral infection sometimes leads to inflammation in the lungs and then the alveoli start to fill with fluid and blood cells until we get what's called consolidation where large areas of the lung become filled with fluid and debris. So you can imagine these patients have reduced alveolar ventilation. They still have normal perfusion and so this is shunt and patients become hypoxic and hypercapnic. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder. It's autosomal recessive. The specific genetic problem is a defect in their chloride ion transport. And this affects epithelial cells in many tissues, the lungs, the pancreas, the liver, the GI tract, the reproductive organs. Secretions become thick and sticky and dehydrated. And exocrine glands, glands that secrete like your pancreatic enzymes, also become destroyed. The main issue with cystic fibrosic, fibrosis patients is chronic pulmonary infection because they get this thick, sticky, dried out mucus that they can't clear out of their lungs. They are at risk for COPD, chronic sinusitis, cough, dyspnea, and this terrible sputum production. Their treatment includes bronchodilators, mechanical clearance of thick secretions, so suctioning and percussion on their chest wall, and they are always requiring antibiotic therapy for the constant recurrent severe infections that they get in their lungs. So these people have pneumonia regularly. They also get diabetes because of the destruction of their pancreas, azospermia because of destruction of secretion of uh, the uh, um, of sperm in the testicles and pancreatic insufficiency. Finally, let's talk about pneumothorax. A pneumothorax is when there is gas in the pleural space. Here's a picture of an inflated lung and you can't even barely see the pleural space because as we know, the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura are right up next to each other with just a tiny bit of fluid and negative pleural in the pleural space, which helps keep the lung expanded even when you breathe out. Here, air has gotten into the pleural space, and now the lung collapses. How did air get in there? It could happen if there's a tear in the parietal pleura or the visceral pleura. So here's a tear in the visceral pleura, and, and air comes out of the lungs into the space, or if you puncture the chest wall and get a tear in the parietal pleura and air comes in from the outside. Lots of things can cause a pneumothorax. They can happen spontaneously or after lung disease. Rib fractures can certainly cause this kind of damage. Puncture of the pleura during central line placement. If you overinflate the lungs and cause a mechanical ventilation barotrauma in the lungs, or if a surgeon injures the diaphragm and air comes from the abdominal cavity into the pleural space. Here's a patient's chest x-ray, and if you look, you can see on one side, there's a little cloudiness. This is normal lung tissue. On the other side, it's nice and clear. This is not nice, because all we see is uh, air without any lung tissue. This is a pneumothorax, 
and here you can see the lung all squished down and collapsed. If you look carefully, you can also see their trachea is deviating to the right. Um, I'm just looking carefully here. And when patients have a pneumothorax, it can get worse with positive pressure ventilation. So that's a big issue for us in anesthesia. Attention pneumothorax is the most important thing you need to know about pneumothorax uh, for keeping patients safe. Because in attention pneumothorax, gas goes in and then it gets trapped. And then every breath, more gas goes in. So think about, for example, a, um, a hole in the lung. And every time you give them a breath with the ventilator, gas goes into here. But every time you let them breathe out, gas doesn't escape back into the lungs. So we have a one-way valve causing more and more and more air to build up in here. And it starts pushing on the heart and decreases um, venous return, decreases cardiac filling, and leads to hypotension and even cardiac arrest. Uh, so in these patients, um, you can actually see the difference in an x-ray between tension pneumothorax and regular pneumothorax. In a regular pneumothorax, this is all collapsed and everything will sort of shift to the side of the pneumothorax. In a tension pneumothorax, we have all this pressure buildup and it's going to push everything away from the pneumothorax. Signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax might be dyspnea or cough, chest pain, hypotension, hypoxemia, tachycardia, and decreased breath sounds on the side of the pneumothorax. The treatment for a pneumothorax is to suck the air out of that pleural space to allow the lung to re-expand. If it's a tension pneumothorax, we actually stick a needle in right at the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line in order to relieve that built-up pressure. But then the lung needs to heal, and that's done by evacuating air from the pleural space. And sometimes we may need to place a chest tube if there continues to be air leakage until the lung can heal itself. Finally, I just want to show you a quick diagram of how a chest tube suction works. So we stick a tube into this patient's pleural space. And obviously, we, we want to suck on that tube until we get a vacuum again and the lung can expand. But a chest tube is more complicated than that. So here's the tube that's going into the patient's pleural space. Suction is applied to it. And there may be some blood or some fluid in that space and it's going to collect in these chambers so we can measure their outputs. Because if there's bleeding, we want to be able to know how much bleeding there is. So fluid collects here. Then there was a hole in the pleura, and so it's sucking some air out, and that air goes past these drainage chambers. It goes down here, and it goes past a water seal chamber. The air bubbles through the water seal chamber, and it's sucked out to wall suction. And the wall suction is usually set at about negative 20 centimeters of water. So now we're sucking out, and if there's a continued air leak, we're going to continue seeing bubbles going through this water seal chamber. Or when the air leak stops, then we won't see bubbles anymore, and we'll have a nice negative pressure of minus 20 inside this tubing, keeping the lung inflated until it heals. Over here we have a suction control chamber, which we can use that makes sure we don't have more than negative 20 centimeters of water because we don't want to cause injury with very high suction in the space. At some point, we could clamp this off and see if our suction is maintained or if we lose our vacuum because there's still an air leak. So you'll hear people talking about clamping off a chest tube. Does the patient still have an air leak? What we want to see is has the lung repaired its hole or are they still getting air into the pleural space every time they breathe in and breathe out. Once the patient no longer has an air leak, then you're ready to pull out the chest tube and close the uh, space in their chest wall where the tube is going in, and hopefully the patient at that point has recovered. That's it for our big discussion of pulmonary physiology. Please spend some time reviewing this material. Let me know if you have questions. And thanks for all your attention.